G'day everyone, Anthony Marinak here. I've been asked by a few people to explain the decision of the High Court in the recent appeal by Catholic Cardinal George Pell, who was convicted of certain serious offences against children and spent about a year in prison. The concerns expressed by people asking me for an explanation have all been pretty much identical. They ask how a court can overturn the decision of a jury. If a jury has decided that a person is guilty of a crime, then how can the court overturn that decision? Let's start by reviewing what has happened to get us to this point. It's now notorious right around the world that for at least the last century, the major churches, and in particular the Catholic Church, have had an endemic problem which resulted in many children becoming the victims of very serious offences. Here in Australia, that led to a Royal Commission and to a national redress scheme in order to provide compensation to those who were affected. However, it has also been possible for victims to make criminal complaints. And there have been quite a number of successful prosecutions to bring perpetrators to justice. Certain allegations were made against George Pell, who holds the Catholic rank of Cardinal Priest in the Catholic Church. This means that worldwide he is outranked only by the seven cardinal bishops and by the Pope himself. Those allegations were heard in the Supreme Court of Victoria. At the first trial, the jury were unable to reach a verdict. At the second trial, the jury pronounced him to be guilty and he was sentenced to six years in prison with a non-parole period of three years and six months. He appealed to the Victorian Court of Appeal, which denied his appeal, and then he finally appealed to the High Court, which upheld his appeal and released him from prison on the 7th of April 2020. That's the judgment that I will discuss in this video. Before we get to the judgment itself, there are three underlying principles that I want to talk about briefly. You won't be able to understand the judgment unless you understand these principles, and I, I promise they're not too complicated. The first principle is equality before the law. Everyone who appears before a criminal court appears as an equal, regardless of whether they're a cardinal of the Catholic Church or whether they're a homeless, unemployed drug addict. Everyone gets exactly the same trial with exactly the same rules. That's important in this case for two reasons. First, Pell should not get any special favours as a result of him being an internationally important person. His trial was exactly the same as the trial of any other person for the same offences with the possible exception of the fact that his sentencing hearing was broadcast due to the limited size of the courtroom. Now, of course, it's true that not everyone can afford to appeal to the High Court, but the rules once Pell got there were exactly the same for him as they would be for anyone else. The second reason equality before the law was so important is a far more human reason. I mean, it seems clear that there are many, many people who were the victims of offending by priests. And virtually none of those will have the satisfaction of seeing justice done and seeing their offenders go to jail. Too much time has passed. Too many offenders have died. And so there was a danger that the trial of George Pell would become almost like a trial of the whole church. There was a danger that he, as such a senior person in the church, could be held responsible for the whole church. But that would be wrong. That would be injustice. The court's only proper concern was whether he as an individual man committed the offences of which he was accused. No other questions mattered. The second principle you need to understand is the presumption of innocence. At the start of a trial every single person is presumed to be innocent and they remain innocent unless and until the prosecution can prove them guilty beyond reasonable doubt. The accused person has no duty to show that they didn't do the crime. And the prosecution must meet a high standard of proof. If the prosecution shows the person might have done the crime, that's not enough. If the prosecution shows that the person probably did the crime, that's not enough. If there is any reasonable doubt at all about whether the accused person committed the crime, then they must be found not guilty. It's inevitable that this means sometimes guilty people go free when the case against them is not strong enough. But it is a central hallmark of our system, a core component of our very common law freedoms, 
that we would rather see 10 guilty people go free than convict one innocent person. The system is very deliberately stacked in favour of the accused person. The final principle you need to understand is the role of judge and jury. In our system, the judge decides the law and the jury decides the facts. The jury are randomly selected, independent, unbiased, normal people. The jury has the role of deciding if they are convinced, beyond reasonable doubt, that the accusations against the defendant are true. The system should always pay deep respect to the verdict of a jury. So that brings us to the Pell case. The allegations, which were brought more than 20 years after the events allegedly occurred, were that on two separate occasions, after presiding over the Sunday Solemn Mass in St Patrick's Cathedral in East Melbourne, Pell interfered with two 13-year-old boys. Those boys were members of the church choir and Pell was then the Archbishop of Melbourne. By the time they came to trial, one of the boys had died in an accident. We can see problems for the prosecution straight away. For one thing, all the witnesses would be trying to remember things which had happened more than 20 years earlier. Some of the witnesses, who might have given evidence on behalf of Pell, had aged into senility and were no longer able to give compelling evidence. The second alleged victim had died and so could give no evidence at all, other than the fact that around 2001 he had told his mother that Pell never interfered with him. The only real evidence which the prosecution had was the evidence of the remaining victim. The jury, and the Court of Appeal for that matter, found that the victim's evidence was compelling and convincing. But there were some really serious practical problems with it. For one thing, the offending supposedly happened in an area called the priest's sacristy, which is a back room where priests get into their robes. And it was supposed to have happened right after the Mass. Only thing is, Pell's very clear habit was to go to the steps of the cathedral after Mass to greet people who were leaving the service. He stayed there usually for between 10 minutes and half an hour. This was memorable because he was a new archbishop and the previous archbishop hadn't done this. So he would have needed to have been in two places at once to commit the offences or alternatively he would need to have deviated from his usual practice on those particular days. Second, the two boys were part of a huge dignified formal procession. There were over 50 choir boys in the procession, plus adult choristers, plus altar servers, plus other priests. The choir master was responsible for ensuring that the children remained in their place, and he did this with a military level of discipline. Yet allegedly, two 13-year-olds escaped from their place in the procession with nobody else noticing, and then they allegedly encountered Pell. Third, Pelt was an archbishop, and this was a solemn mass. He couldn't just wander off on his own. He had an attendant who remained with him at all times. So for the complainant's story to be true, here's how it would have had to unfold. After the service, instead of going to the steps of the cathedral, Pell would have had to have headed into the priest's sacristy, a room where he had no business being because he had his own changing room. He would somehow have had to have given his own attendant the slip, and at that very moment, the two boys must have given the choir master the slip and made their way into the priest's sacristy, where they had no business being. And at that point, Pell, who knew nothing about these boys, is alleged to have told them off for being in the sacristy and then spontaneously, without any further discussion at all, committed offences against them. The only evidence of any of this was the evidence of the complainant. Now, the jury pretty clearly was convinced. They found him guilty. He appealed twice and came to the High Court. All seven judges heard the appeal and they gave a joint judgment, seven to zero, in Pell's favour. The first important thing the High Court did was to note the importance of the jury. They said, the jury performs its function on the basis that its decisions are made unanimously and after the benefit of sharing the jurors' subjective assessments of the witnesses. Judges of courts of criminal appeal do not perform the same function in the same way as the jury, or with the same advantages that the jury brings to the discharge of its function. In other words, a court of appeal, including the High Court, 
should not just substitute its own view for that of the jury. If the jury has one opinion and the appeal court has another opinion, then the starting point is that the jury should win. However, there is one exception to this. You see, the very reason that we have courts of appeal is that our system of justice is made up of people and people are fallible. And so if a mistake gets made in one level of court, the idea is that an appeal court can catch that mistake and fix it. In the case of a jury, the verdict of the jury will only be disturbed. It will only be considered to be a mistake in very, very limited cases. The High Court or the Court of Appeal is required to ask whether, upon the whole of the evidence, it was open to the jury to be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the accused was guilty. In other words, if the evidence was so strong in favour of acquittal that no reasonable jury could have been satisfied beyond reasonable doubt, but a jury somehow gets there anyway, a Court of Appeal or the High Court could step in. In this case, the High Court found that there was unchallenged evidence, evidence accepted on both sides, that Pell had in fact gone to the steps to meet people on the days that he was alleged to have committed the offences. There was unchallenged evidence that he had always been accompanied by his attendant. And there was unchallenged evidence that there were so many people moving around the part of the church where the offending allegedly took place that the offending simply couldn't have taken place unnoticed. As a result, Pell was acquitted. He, as an individual person standing before the law, was entitled to be presumed innocent of his offences until the prosecution proved those offences beyond reasonable doubt. The prosecution did not prove those offences beyond reasonable doubt. The jury can only have reached its verdict by ignoring those reasonable doubts. And so justice required that he must go free. We will never know for sure what happened to the complainant in this matter. Memories are complicated. Perhaps it is the case that they experienced some traumatic event at someone's hands during their time in the cathedral choir. They and other victims have nothing but my heartfelt sympathy. But these offences against this particular man were not proved beyond reasonable doubt. And the reasonable doubt was sufficient that the High Court unanimously took the unusual step of overturning a jury verdict. If this video has raised personal difficulties for anybody watching it, please reach out to those who love you or please reach out to professional organisations who can help you. I hope this video helps you to understand the outcome in the Pell Appeal and I'll see you again soon.